Hello and welcome everyone um, to the Finequity Tools Workshop on how to advance gender diversity and leadership in financial services. This is uh, the first of our workshops in this series um, that is bringing to life some of the tools that we shared as a part of knowledge and resource guides uh, over the past year. Um, we have a very exciting 90 minutes lined up for you um, where we'll get to hear more about a practical uh, tool on how that you can use on it to advance uh, gender diversity and leadership within your institutions, and then you'll get a chance to to dive into um, a little bit more on some of the issues and, and discuss what you can do, and we'll also hear from um, a colleague about how they have used uh, this particular tool. So if we can move to the next slide, please. So uh, for today's session, uh, we have Sarah Bittoni, who's the Director of Diversity and Leadership Programs at Women's Oil Banking, um, and she will be walking us through their gender assessment methodology that has been developed based on years of experience and used across uh, Women's World Banking Network and a lot with several partners. Uh, we also then will have a chat with Shweta Singh, who's the head of human resources at Seva Grihrin Limited, or Separa, uh, as it's called, a housing finance institution in India. Uh, my name is Nisha Singh. I am the thematic lead for gender transformative solutions for Finequity, and I will be moderating this session. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things um, as we move into the agenda for this session. Uh, all of you can feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. Uh, we'll be using the chat uh, to get your input during this main part of the session. And then when we go into the, the small group discussion, which is indicated on the agenda, you'll have an opportunity to unmute yourselves and speak as well. Uh, so a quick run through for the agenda introductions, which is where we're at right now. Uh, and then I will invite Sarah to walk us through the, the gender assessment methodology uh, and you know the practical aspects of the tool and what they've learned uh, in, in using the tool across different organization. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about why diversity, equity, and inclusion matter. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, we'll get into uh, a conversation with Shweta uh, about how Sakara has used uh, the gender assessment methodology and what they have done since uh, conducting the assessment. And then the last part of today's session is uh, where you get to go into small groups and dig into some of the topics, and then we'll come back and wrap up. So it's going to go by very quickly and in the interest of time, I'm gonna keep moving. So if we can just move to the next slide. So Sarah, I'm gonna invite you to come in and talk a little bit about the gender assessment methodology and why gender diversity and uh, equity is important. Great, thank you, uh, Nisha. Thanks for the introduction. I'm glad to be here today. Um, working on the gender assessment is just one part of my work at Women's World Banking, but it's often uh, my favorite uh, pro project to work on. So glad to be here talking with all of you about this important topic and sharing a little bit about our approach. Um, so I'll start by uh, introducing Women's World Banking briefly. I'm sure uh, most people on the line are familiar with our organization. Um, but if we can move to the next slide. Um, so Women's World Banking is a global network. Uh, this is a quick snapshot of our reach across the globe. We have 64 network members that operate in 33 countries, altogether reaching 160 million women. Um, our mission is to expand the economic assets, participation, and power of low-income women and their households by helping them access financial services, knowledge, and markets. We partner with financial institutions, uh, service providers, policymakers, investors, and donors to bring women-centered products, services, uh, marketing practices, and policies to market. Um, for more than 40 years, Women's World Banking has provided low-income women around the world with financial tools and confidence. 
Uh, we do research, product design, leadership training, support for organizational diversity, and we also invest through our Gender Lens Private Equity Fund. Uh, so moving into the conversation for, day, for today, we really wanted to start by asking this question. From your perspective, as practitioners, as professionals, what is important about a focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion? So I think the Fin Equity team will be supporting and gathering some of those uh, responses. Yeah. yeah, feel free to type your responses in the chat and, and we're monitoring them. So, you know, it, a, a, a sentence or two, and if anybody here disagrees uh, about the focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, please share that as well. I'll we'll give that a moment uh, for people to have a, a reflective moment to think and to start typing your responses here into the chat. Why does diversity, equity, and inclusion matter? Matter for organizations, uh, matter for women's financial inclusion. I see first response from Dan Norell. Inclusion helps more families get out of extreme poverty and improve their food security. Great, yes. Uh, any other thoughts uh, to increase countries' economic development? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Uh, create access to all those who deserve it in a sustainable manner. Um, it's a question of human rights and social justice. Yes. Uh, it's fair, but also because women are more responsible and reliable as customers. So increase job opportunities, women's labor force participation. Yes. Market opportunities. Transgender outcomes contributing to SDG 5, and not just that, but many more of the other SDGs okay. as well. Uh, remove barriers. Okay. So, while Otherwise, those are trying to access the same services as others, women in, in a lot of cases. Yeah. DEI is a means to level the field and close the financial and leadership gap for underserved markets. Yeah. Very well said, Jose. Uh, um, it brings a different perspective, so diversity in perspective and innovation, and you know, uh, which ultimately creates organizational sustainability. So I think, yeah, Sarah, we've got a a pretty informed audience. Yes, um, I love that the group here has brought out really the 360 degrees of some of the the reasons that we believe at Women's World Banking. Um, that diversity within organizations, especially those organizations that are setting policy and regulation um, that creates an enabling environment or doesn't uh, for women's financial inclusion, and those organizations that are designing products and services for women, um, we believe it's critical to have women represented throughout those organizations. When we're talking about serving the women's market, um, it's important to have frontline staff who reflect, who mirror that market uh, that you are trying to engage, that can connect um, with customers and who customers can see themselves in that sales force, in that diverse sales force. And it's not just at the sales force level, of course, it's important to have uh, women represented all throughout organizations and especially at the table where decisions about products and services get, get made. Some of you pointed to the business case for diversity in your comments. And uh, we know from research evidence that having women at board levels, at senior management levels, especially is associated with things like better financial performance, um, higher quality decision outcomes, increased innovation. I saw that in the chat as well. Um, and in general, a healthier uh, organization, more engaged and productive 
workforce. One of you mentioned sustainability. And um, when you have a happy, engaged, productive workforce, you have a more sustainable organization. However, we also know that for gender diversity to have a positive impact, we need numbers matter, representation matters, but we need to look beyond the numbers. Um, we can't just add women and stir. There needs to be a clear strategic imperative from the top levels of an organization. There needs to be a focus and work on organizational culture, creating a culture of belonging, of inclusion, and uh, psychological safety. There also needs to be a conversation about structural inequality and a willingness to examine and often shift really ingrained um, power dynamics. So we look, uh, when we work on our gender assessments, our gender assessment methodology, our gender performance studies, we really look at the gamut of these kinds of issues. Um, on the internal side, we are looking at the organizational policies that scaffold the employee experience, procedures, um, and we dive deeply into perspectives and experiences of staff to really understand challenges that exist, as well as opportunities that we can further build on um, for women's staff at all levels in the organization. Um, we also have married this internal assessment with a look at the external market, at the products, services, and how an organization is currently engaging with their women customers and how they might position themselves to reach new women customers. Um, so we look at the business strategy and really creating a roadmap for the future, looking at opportunities, um, short and long term for engaging the women's market. So for those of you uh, here today that are interested in potentially conducting your own uh, gender assessment in your organization, or some of you may be wanting to support partner organizations or investees to take a critical look at how they're doing uh, when it comes to serving women, internally as staff and externally as customers or focusing on one or the other is possible as well, but we believe they're interlinked. Uh, I wanted to show this snapshot of the full deep dive gender assessment uh, that we conduct. This is our full approach at Women's World Banking. Um, we start by working closely with the partner organization to align on the problem at hand. You know, what really do they think is happening today? when it comes to serving this market. And we talk about opportunities that we can explore. Uh, we also put in a data request to try to understand as best as we can from the available data, the current state, gaps, uh, trends, et cetera. Next, we do what we call an institutional diagnostic. We speak with a broad number of women at the senior management, or pardon me, uh, senior management members, women and men, um, including board members to understand how gender fits with their strategic priorities and how better uh, gender diversity and inclusion could drive better performance. In the diagnose phase, we conduct uh, secondary research. So we want to understand the overall labor market conditions, the competitive environment. And this is where we also do deep dive primary qualitative research talking to a sample, sample of staff. Sometimes we talk to potential staff and we talk to clients and non-clients as well as others as useful to the particular engagement. Finally, recommendations from the study are rolled into a gender action plan with key performance indicators, reporting schedules and accountability mechanisms. Um, one thing that I think is really important about the gender action plan is that that's not something that Women's World Banking delivers to an organization. Um, we really want to work closely with the organization so that there is you know, ownership, so the gender action plan makes sense. And it's something that they believe can be implemented and can make a difference for their business. Um, starting a couple of years ago, Women's World Banking started rolling out gender performance studies using our gender assessment methodology to every new investee of our private equity fund. 
um, through a technical assistance program that's managed by Women's World Banking Asset Management and financed uh, by contributions from the European Union and the German Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development and managed by the German Development Bank. Um, so we're now able to conduct one of these studies with each of our investees. Um, so that's something I lead from the internal gender diversity standpoint. And we're really excited to be able to do that and then to really partner with our investees to move forward on the gender action plans and then really be in a position to quantify um, those outcomes over time. Okay. So on the next slide, just wanted to quickly touch on, you know, what are we looking to learn when we conduct a gender assessment? And of course, these questions vary depending on the specific institution we're partnering with, their business model, um, strategic priorities, and identified areas of potential challenge opportunity. But generally speaking, these are the kinds of high-level questions that we're asking. You know, how can we create a workplace environment that attracts, retains, promotes, and pays women employees and leaders at the same rate as men? And how can we better unlock the potential really of all employees and particularly women. On the customer side, we're looking at how to reach more women clients with products and services that truly meet their needs and preferences. And we want to figure out, you know, if there are opportunities to better serve and engage with the women customers that we already have. So for the remainder of the conversation today, we're going to focus on the internal staff diversity side of the gender assessment, um, because that is, that's my particular focus. Um, but at the end of this conversation, we'll be sharing a couple of different tools that we have that will allow you to look at both the internal and external operating uh, environment for your particular organization or partners as well. Um, so over the years, I have worked on many gender assessments in markets as diverse as Uganda, Tajikistan, Egypt, India, Kenya, Nigeria. I've worked with banks, microfinance institutions, fintechs, um, and every organization has its own context, its own strengths, its own unique challenges that we find. Um, one of the common issues that I do see really across all of these diverse players and diverse markets is the role that deeply held beliefs that are related to um, the socialized role of men and women, mental models that exist, and really the potential for biases, many of them unconscious, to get in the way if not surfaced and addressed at the organizational system-wide level. Um, for example, I've come across beliefs that women don't want to work in the field, uh, or that married women's families won't let them continue to work um, after they have children. Um, and these beliefs are often one of the main um, barriers that can limit an organization's ability to hire women. Um, we also hear what I term you know, positive biases about women and men. For example, that women make better customer service agents because they're attractive. Um, while men are more suited to strategic decision-making roles, like that's something that men bring naturally. Um, and this can also lead to gender clustering by function and can limit women's ability to move up the ladder uh, to those top you know, strategic critical business positions. So thinking about this issue of unconscious bias, I um, wanted to ask a question for everyone here. I'd like to hear in the chat once again um, about your experiences or observations of how bias can show up in the workplace specifically. Um, so again, use the chat and you can comment about either a time when perhaps you yourself experienced unconscious bias or a time when you observed something happening in the workplace due to deeply held beliefs or biases, whether conscious or unconscious. Um, and while you start to use the chat to type those thoughts in, 
I'll share an example that I came across uh, recently. I was facilitating a session with a group of women senior leaders, women in really high up roles in their organizations. And they were sharing some of the things that happened to them as women in top roles in their organizations, often um, women who are in a male dominated environment, things that happen that continue to shock and surprise them. So one of these women who was, you know, basically the number two or three most senior person in her bank shared that when she walks into a meeting with her boss, he will ask her, how are your kids? And then a male colleague will walk in and her boss will ask a question that's directly related to business performance. And for her, this reinforces a sense of imposter syndrome, the idea that that man maybe belongs at the table. Uh, more so than she does. So we're seeing assumptions of professional interests and capabilities that just as you shared there. Um, I also thought about the example that you and I discussed about uh, walking onto a plane, uh, several senior women have said this, and you know, they're, they're often told by people, oh, that's the way you're going, right, towards economy, even when it's a deputy governor of a central bank, because that's where, you know, so there are assumptions of where women belong, spaces where women belong. Okay. Ability to collect uh, Oh, yeah, this is a good one. Ability to collect uh, loan repayments. You know, there are these assumptions about women are less strict than men, so maybe they won't be able to enforce it. Yeah, yeah. Right, so we can see this. My example is at the very top of the organization, and this example is for, you know, yeah. the skill level staff that are engaging with customers and assumptions that, that exist. Yeah, and then there's, uh, you know, uh, women. Uh, recruitment processes in case of Indian MFIs, where people assume that women in sales roles cannot travel or commit to longer time as, you know, as compared to their male counterparts and how much of that is reality, we might get Shweta to talk a little bit about it. Let's see. And the expectation that women take on hospitality roles within an organization, serve drinks during meetings, Take minutes, yes, that's a very common one, Wanza. Definitely. And we have some counter examples here, right? It's not true that women don't want to go to the field. It is an assumption. Yeah. And maybe yeah. some women don't, maybe some men don't. Um, we can't really make assumptions about what people are, are willing to do or what their preferences are just based on their gender or other characteristics. Yeah, and uh, Adama said the idea that women will have to go on maternity leave or if they're mothers, they will have to take time off to take care of children. So, you know, they're going to be less productive. Uh, denial of data evidence that shows improved performance of women as borrowers. Uh, that's, yeah, when the data exists, yeah. Uh, sometimes that doesn't even exist. All right, I think we got a good uh, set of examples. Okay. And oh yeah, that women want smaller loans. Yeah, and I love, I don't love this one, but women over a certain age don't want to work. I've right. definitely come across that in the gender assessments. And it's it's so interesting because people are sometimes hiring managers are nervous to bring women on board because they believe, you know, once they are of childbearing age, they'll be growing families and they won't be as available. At the same time, they don't want older women, you know, that may have their families already established, children that are older, that are more self-sufficient. Um, so this is really limiting across a woman's, uh, you know, life cycle. She can't work when she's young and she can't work when she's old. So, you know, we just have to hire, hire men. Yeah, that's a, that's a great example that I've seen. Okay, um, so you can keep these coming if they're still coming to mind, all great. Um, illustrations of how bias can play out and really impact um, the business and the customers as well. 
So I'm sure that everyone in the room is familiar with evaluating or designing interventions based on the customer journey and how we add value at every stage of our interaction with our clients or end users. Uh, for the organizational gender assessment, we take a similar approach and we look at the experience, the employee experience across the talent life cycle from when a potential employee first becomes aware of the company or employment opportunity throughout their employment to their decision to stay or to exit the company. Um, so we're going to hear uh, from Shweta about the Satara uh, gender assessment in a few minutes. And we applied this lens to the work that we did together. And we will be diving into the different phases of the talent life cycle in the breakouts. So I thought it would be helpful to say a few words about the model that I've put up here on the slide. Um, so really everything stems from strategy. Um, one of the most important success factors for creating a gender diverse, inclusive, and equitable organization is that there is a clearly stated commitment from the top that diversity and that diversity is clearly articulated as a corporate priority. This means uh, setting goals or targets most of the time and usually involves a lot of repeated communication about why diversity matters for the business, for the staff, and for the end beneficiaries or clients. Um, in terms of attracting talent, I saw that coming up in the chat as well, that bias can, can really prevent uh, organizations from attracting diverse talent. You know, the question here is really what is the face or the brand that the company is putting out into the world? And one of the things we often look at is the language um, and the imagery on the jobs page uh, and in job adverts are the words that are being used more likely to attract male candidates, more likely to attract women candidates? Um, and what are the channels that are being used to attract a potential staff. You know, word of mouth is a great asset, but is your mostly male staff sending out vacancies to their mostly male network of friends or former classmates? Um, when it comes to the hiring process, once someone decides to apply, is the subsequent experience inclusive or is bias, you know, sneaking in to that process? I remember talking years ago to a young finance graduate who was looking for work in banking, and she was asked by a hiring manager, when do you plan to get married? When do you plan to have a baby? She withdrew her application and she kept looking elsewhere. She thought, you know, this is not a place for me. So who are candidates speaking to? What questions are being asked? And who makes the ultimate hiring decision? Um, once a candidate is on board, the, it's really, this is such a critical moment when someone first joins an organization. Um, what steps are taken to make them feel included and valued? Um, an inclusive onboarding process involves making everyone feel welcome and that they belong. Um, a well-known cognitive bias is affinity bias. We like to talk to and connect with people that look like us, have a similar background to us. So our people who are joining the organization, particularly diverse hires, are they you know, part of the conversation? Um, in terms of learning and development, who is accessing these opportunities? Is it equitable across the organization? Who gets to learn? Who is invested in and is able to develop? Um, especially when we're talking about more informal development, you know, does everyone have access to mentors, to sponsors, and um, are events happening during working hours or perhaps systematically in the evening when maybe someone with a family, whether that's a woman or a man, isn't really able to join? And is it happening in a space where women feel comfortable? Are people meeting at, at a bar where perhaps a woman might not be able to go? Or is it in a more you know, professional environment? In terms of reward and recognition, one example here is equal pay. Does staff uh, earn equal pay for equal work, regardless of diversity aspects? Um, under the surface, whose work is visible and elevated? Um, I think many of us have heard of stories where a woman senior is sitting around a table with colleagues and shares an opinion, uh, a thought, an idea, and it's kind of passed over and let let to lie on the table. 
until a man says the exact same thing. And then that idea, you know, is taken up and, and run with. Um, so whose voice is heard? Who gets the credit? In terms of progression and performance, um, I definitely encounter in the gender assessments, a lot of biases popping up um, in the moments when we think about promotion. And I think we saw some of that in the chat. There may be assumptions about who is willing to work hard, to spend extra hours at work, you know, to move into that more senior role. And those may not really be true. Um, rating systems can often be biased um, and left to manager preference rather than systematic um, and transparent. So finally, if you've done all of these things right, right moved through all of these areas, addressed biases, um, you've set the tone, established goals and accountability, attracted, hired and onboarded diverse candidates, you've grown them and rewarded them and adva advanced talent inclusively, you'll have a loyal, engaged and high performing workforce. Um, there's always a healthy and natural level of attrition but it's important to conduct exit interviews and analyze the data by whatever diversity aspects are important to your organization, including gender, um, and monitor attrition rates on a gender disaggregated basis to look for any patterns. So I will stop there, uh, Nisha, and hand it back to you. Great, thanks, uh, Sarah, for walking us through the, the methodology and the process and uh, a good discussion on unconscious bias. Uh, we do have a few questions uh, in the chat, but what I'm gonna do is uh, have a conversation with Shweta and then we'll come back and take all of those questions together. Uh, so Shweta, uh, welcome to this workshop and maybe we can start with a little, uh, you telling us a little bit more about uh, Sitara, the organization, and uh, you know uh, who you are and what you've been doing. <clears throat> Thank you, Nisha. Thank you, uh, Nisha, Sarah, and for such a good conversation that we just had. And uh, uh, so uh, let me just quickly uh, tell you a little bit about myself. So as you all know, I am Shweta Singh and I head HR admin and TND at Seva Grerin. Um, I have more than 15, 16 years of experience uh, in hardcore HR and I've been part of a couple of consulting uh, organization. I've also worked with manufacturing and uh, service industry. From last seven, eight years, I'm associated with uh, uh, banking, NBFC industries particularly. Um, so prior to that, I was associated with, again was uh, with housing finance company. And uh, right now I had uh, HR and TND as just mentioned at Seva Credit. Um, so this is a little bit about myself. And um, I mean, it's, it's a great uh, proud moment for me to talk about the organization where I am associated. And um, I would love to, uh, you know, mention a couple of important uh, points about the organization. Uh, so before I talk about uh, Seva Krerin, just wanted to mention that uh, the word Seva has a, the full form of Seva is Self-Employed Women Association. Um, and Seva was born basically from a trade union movement for all self-employed in 1972. Um, so Seva Grerin uh, is, uh, you know, part of the bigger umbrella of Seva Foundation, which is a trade union, and it's among the biggest trade union in India. Uh, it grew out of the Textile Labor Association, and which is India's oldest and largest union of textile workers, founded in 1920 by uh, Anusaya Sarabhai. Maybe uh, some of you would know and some of you uh, may not know. And Seva was the first trade union of informal workers, uh, especially, uh, you know, in India, where there was a lot of formal uh, trade unions for men, but there was no such uh, trains to take care of the rights and needs of women. So that's where Seva as an association was uh, founded. Uh, eventually, Seva realized various needs of women, be it uh, the need of having the insurance, need of having uh, the, you know, uh, house. 
so when it came so lay off lately seva has multiple ventures as the overall organization so off lately towards the end when seva realized that uh, you know majority of the needs they have already taken care however for women it's extremely important to have their own house so that's where seva as the entity decided to invest in the next arm which is seva grerin limited and that's how seva grerin was formed so we started our operations way back in uh, 2015 and uh, since then we have never looked back and we are uh, as an organization we build the organization departments we have grown the business and uh, right now we are at the juncture where we are growing the business very fast along with also developing seva grerin as an institute right from getting the right set of people to process to policies and also um, helping the economically weaker uh, segment weaker strata of the country especially women so basically seva grerin we provide housing loan facility to women who are women who are deprived primarily from banks or bigger housing finance companies because they have a progressive title so we help them uh, you know to uh, provide loan so that they can fulfill their dream of owning their own house and um, also we can uplift them in terms of their overall lifestyle uh, help them uh, their kids and uh, so that's that's a little bit about what we as an organization do from the impact perspective so of Great. course we are there for profit but we have a social impact for the women of this strata great thanks um so you know uh, building assets is a very important part of you know moving out of poverty uh for and especially for women because asset ownership um is is such a challenge um so i know that you know sitara uh, is seva grerin is a part of the women's world banking network can you tell us a little bit about uh why you decided to do a gender assessment what some of the you know initial findings were um in terms of you know areas for improvement or and, and was there anything surprising in those findings for an institution that's focused on women as customers sure uh, nisha so yeah uh, so we were thinking of you know having a gender uh, study done but when we partnered with wwb as uh, it was part of the investment criteria as well um, that they will be investing in seva grerin and would be taking uh, care of this gender action study we all were very excited uh, because getting a overall 360 degree perspective from the organization which is leading uh, this particular agenda since ages so uh, that's how i mean we started this assessment some of the objectives at the start of the gender action plan was basically to increase sitara's uh, position as an organization known for hiring supporting and growing women talent and um, also maintain competitive advantage as employer of choice for women plus improve gender diversity because when at the time when we started this project um, the uh, women population at sgrl was very low i mean and everyone right from the board to all the senior stakeholders they wanted to have a good diversity within the organization uh beat from the customer side or from the employer side plus there were also some of the external objectives like increasing sitara's penetration of the low income women's market by reaching more women with existing geographies through various loan products and uh, develop expansion strategies for newer geographies as well so these were some of the objectives uh, with which we started the study and uh, some of the uh, i mean extremely great findings that uh, you know came from the study was that deeply held beliefs among all the staffs and you know the uh, perceived barriers limited to gender balance and particularly in field roles so uh, 
as a i mean the similar model that sara has shared some times back uh, we worked on the same model where a lot of data was collected 360 degree study was done and uh, so we zeroed down on a couple of findings from the customer perspective how to increase the penetration uh, of sitara within the customer then the second finding overall finding was what what all should we do as an organization to curb the biases to have more inclusive uh, workplace so one barrier we saw as a finding was beliefs and perception among our own staff that uh, there are certain roles which women are not good at um, there are certain aspects or attributes women of that attributes only should be hired and many more so a good study in terms of beliefs and perception was presented um, also a lot of recruitment uh, biases so uh, uh, that you know initially we were as sara also mentioned and nisha that uh, you know most of the hiring in housing finance especially in our company was happening through word of mouth and these word of mouth was spreading through mails so of course mail spreading the word of mouth in their mail network hence it could be a possibility that the women percentage was uh, very low then they also came out with some of the findings in terms of performance uh, perception around performance that men are stronger performer uh, plus you know uh, also we came with a good uh, you know inside that uh, wwb basically that women were um, underrepresented in field roles with fewer opportunity for advancement retention though retention was um, high in terms of women but uh, um, retention was low attrition attrition was low but retention was high so that's kind of you know some of the cross tabs uh, awareness they came up with plus little bit also around acquisition engagement retention so they largely these were among the some of the findings so uh, and uh, to to our uh, belief uh, some imp mostly some of the important point also was from the business perspective that they mentioned that uh, approval rates uh, you know that our own women employees they were doing were basically on the higher side the quality of files the quality of portfolio that women was contributing was on the higher side still women were not getting promoted so that was also one of the extremely good insight that why and why it's happening and why we as an organization could not see so hence i think uh, there's a reason to have a structured gender action plan in place with the right set of kras and uh, we should review it and of course there should be an overall some committee based uh, you know team who can monitor this action so a lot of good insights uh, for the organization and uh, we were able to make significant uh, improvements also with the help of wwb Great. Um, lots of, you know, rich insights there. I wanted to pick up on a couple of things. Um, one is you mentioned there was, you know, you uncovered, a, like the study uncovered a, a lot of deeply held beliefs and biases within the, the staff of the organization and that you had to tackle those. Can you share, you know, like, an example of what what that is and then what you did because um, I think it's always helpful to go into the specifics of these kinds of biases just as we were talking earlier yeah some some of the beliefs and perceptions was that the talent pool is not if I just talk about recruitment that uh, they said since we don't have females hence uh, hence we cannot hire females that was one so we you know, realize that is it actually is it the facts that uh, we don't have female talent pool, especially in business functions, or it's just the unconscious bias that they don't want female in the business function, thinking various perceptions and beliefs that uh, they cannot work late, they have a family to attend, 
they will take leaves or maybe they'll go on maternity if we hire females. So we uh, really looked at the data uh, post the intervention of WWP. And uh, I would be, I would really want to quote that uh, in terms of percentage uh, before And uh, uh, Nisha, uh, I am just switching off my uh, video. Yeah, There's sure. No connectivity. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. We can hear you. Yeah. yeah, I was just saying that in terms of uh, recruitment, before the study done by WWB in sales field staff, the women percentage was roughly two. Oh, I, sorry, Shweta, can you repeat that? I, I didn't hear the percentage. Oh, is it better? Am I yeah. audible? Okay. Yes. All right. So I just said that post the study, the percentage was around 2, 2.5% in sales field staff women. Yeah. Uh, when we interviewed in this, the pers we were able to bring this percentage to 5.4% right okay. now. It's just a matter of one and a half year that from two to and a half percent, we are able to grow our sales women workforce to 5.4 percent. Uh, similarly, another uh, business function, which is credit, which approves the file, loan file, who checks that the papers and everything is right, doc documentation, collaterals. So there, there was zero representation of females. And there also we have made a significant, uh, you know, jump. So we are sitting from zero to 11%. So this data, I mean, this only talks about the perception, the beliefs uh, they had, the, especially the patriarchal beliefs that uh, they don't want women, particularly in business function. So we were able to break these biases by uh, looking at the data objectively the handholding given from WWB. So uh, this is from the, uh, you know, particularly from the recruitment uh, side, I really wanted to bring to everyone's notice. Yeah, I, yeah, and this is a question that often gets asked about, like, how do you attract, and how do, you know, data is a great starting point for starting to understand how women are doing, where the biases are, what the opportunities that, you as an institution might be missing out on if you're not uh, actively looking at the, the makeup of your workforce. Um, there were a couple of other things that we discussed, Shweta, in terms of actions that were taken that I think it would be really useful to get your perspective on. You know, you talked a little bit about creating an accountability mechanism. Uh, once you've created an action plan, an action plan as as unless there, there's somebody, you know, who's kind of constantly looking at it and checking in on what is being done, uh, it's not going to actually yield any results. So uh, I, I think uh, Satara did something really interesting around that, if you could share that. That's right, uh, Nisha. So, uh, of course, with the help of WWB, their insights, we decided, we said that this year, we will be picking just one or two important aspects from the findings. So we said that we will be working on policies, we'll be working on recruitments, we'll also be taking care of trainings from the internal uh, you know, employees perspective. So before that, we thought that it's really important strategically to have a committee, especially a board constituted committee to look at the overall progress of the gender action plan, what internally we are doing and how we are progressing. So that was one important milestone that we set. And uh, we decided to meet at least once in a quarter and important aspects. So that was one. Uh, so from the recruitment, so how now the important aspects, what we did was from the recruitment perspective, uh, you know, we started looking at 
other channels of hiring. One was promoting employee referrals, but then these referrals were not only from the male referrals. So we uh, brought in the policy of employee referrals, especially uh, through the female network, uh, connecting with the various institutions that India largely has, self-help groups, channelizing the own SEVA network, because SEVA as a trade union has trained uh, roughly four lakhs of women so far, more than four lakhs. So we thought of uh, utilizing their referral. We also started internally, uh, you know, calling for, uh, you know, people, candidates through various job boards, uh, LinkedIn, Nokri, and other social media platform. Uh, some of the other initiatives or hiring channels, we also tied up with a lot of banking institutions where fresh graduates, they go for, uh, you know, with an hope to get into some of the banking or housing finance institution. So we channelize that to hire especially freshers, but who comes with the core understanding of mortgages or banking, what it is. So that was a uh, you know added advantage for us. So for them, we started full-fledged batch programs that every 30, 60, 90 uh, days, you know, touch point was there. We hired. So banking institution, they picked up the uh, candidates. They went through the recruitment uh, process, interviews. Those who were finalized, and they were trained by these institutions. And then the second training happened internally at Sitara. So these, these were some of the strategies through which we were able to grow the women percentage yeah. uh, in various yeah. business functions, particularly. Support function, as we know that uh, it's not very difficult to find females, but especially business functions, sales, collection, credit, and operations, these are pretty uh, tough functions. So then we did that. Also, we went to local colleges that has more women representation. So we dovetailed with the colleges who are exclusively for women. We got some good, uh, you know, freshers or there were some uh, also the students who have prior experience and they went for higher studies. So that kind of mix and match we did from the recruitment per se and hence we were able to achieve a significant growth of uh, roughly from, uh, you know, overall 6% to 11%, 6% uh, to 15% now in two years. And uh, overall, if we see our um, in, uh, women percentage was 11% two years back, it has reached 15% overall. So though 3% looks very less, but in terms of numbers, it's it's huge. So, <laughs> so this was uh, from the recruitment side. Uh, then we also did a lot of infrastructure changes, women at branches. So that was also one of the revealing fact by WWB that women never felt safe in the branches because the infrastructure was not such. The especially the need of, for example, toilets separate toilets for male and females. It wasn't uh, met there. The need for CCTV that there is someone who is locally, uh, centrally monitoring basically in case if something goes wrong with the female. So that insecurity was also there. So we, so then we thought of working a lot on infrastructure. So now more than 50% of our branch have separate washrooms for females as compared to 25 to 30% one and a half year back. And initially the CCTV cameras were not there because uh, we were also in the growing stage and never we have got such strong feedback from anyone that, uh, you know, uh, women don't feel safe because, because of one, two, three, four, <laughs> these reasons. So now all our branch infrastructure has a separate washroom plus a monitored cctv cameras we have put a dedicated person to monitor cctv all these little little changes plus the third thing that we did was to ensure that at our branches 
there should not be any lone women employee. Bare minimum two women employee per branch we have to hire. So that there is an affinity. They have someone to speak to, uh, you know. So th these were some. And then we also created employee resource group internally. And uh, where every uh, quarter we meet virtually, we talk about the challenges and try to, you know, see and work around on those areas. So that was also one. And in this employee resource group, we have, uh, you know, senior leaders, um, especially like chief financial officer, head of treasury. Um, ideally, it's a good point in Seva Agrarian that 50% of females at leadership uh, level, basically at leadership level, 50% is female. So we have a good balance there. So strategically, we have uh, brought them also in the ESG group so that females uh, employees, they feel more safe to talk about their problems, a genuine problem. Then recently, we also did a couple of more, uh, you know, employee female pro policies we launched especially in India as a geography, um, and especially in housing finance sector, there are hardly any housing finance, maybe one or two typically, who has launched menstrual policies. I mean, as simple as that. When in our ESG group, we spoke to our employees, they told that this is also one of, one of the problem areas. I mean, we have to stretch for long hours, uh, late till night, we all want to work, but we want some support. We are not shying away from work. So then post the discussion, we launched menstrual policy where we say that you can at least have two days work from home. And we have mandated that it's a no question policy. Managers are not supposed to, you know, ask questions that why are you taking can't you come office for some hours? So we, I mean, that way we have mandated some of uh, small, ba very basic steps like, you know, having a medical kit, especially for during menstrual, if someone has a stomach pain or facilitating hot water bottles or as simple as sanitary pads in the office you know, so that it's easily accessible to all of them. All that small little things we started uh, doing. And as, an, as a policy level, we also said that, uh, uh, you know, as one of the recommendation, now we have a formal exit process uh, internally, as well as we have outsourced this to an external agent who happens to be a female uh, run organization particularly. So all the exit interviews also happens to be done through female. So uh, they have uh, basically uh, gave, gave us the data. When we studied the data, we realized that some of the females, they were on the exit mode because they wanted transfer, SEVA, and did not, if they don't, we don't have a vacancy. So we allow uh, females to exit. So then based on the data, we also uh, came up with a policy that if, any female, they want to take a transfer. We will try to accommodate. And then uh, that we will balance it from the next year business plan. So because uh, there are positions which are very fast moving, especially loan officers. So we said that we'll manage it from there, uh, especially in case of females. So we yeah. came up with such policy as well. And uh, definitely after taking in confidence with, with the business head and all the senior leaders that were there. Uh, Great. This was Thanks, Shweta. Um, sorry to cut you off. I know there's, <laughs> there's a lot that uh, Sathara did, but I, I think it would be great to, uh, to, to wrap this up this part of the discussion and we'll go into smaller groups where uh, everybody can get a chance to talk a little bit more about, you know, uh, around the, the employee talent life cycle, focus on some of their own challenges and, and discuss 
some of these ideas. So, um, you know, and if you're in the same group as Shweta or Sarah, then you could also ask some of your questions. What we're going to do is for very quickly, for 20 minutes, exactly 20 minutes, we're going to break out into these groups. Uh, my colleague Daniel is going to open the breakout rooms and uh, you should see uh, on your screens an option for breakout rooms. Uh, Daniel, can we open the rooms? Uh, yep, the rooms are open. Okay, so on your screen, you'll see five rooms which correspond with the five that are listed on the, the slide. There, we have two rooms on strategy, one on attract, recruit, onboard, one on learning development, one on per progression performance. Each of these is facilitated. Pick a room that you want to go to and um, we'll, we have a facilitator who'll walk you through what to do there and then we'll come back and debrief. So see you in one of the rooms and I'm going to go to my room and if you have trouble, Daniel will be here to help you. All right, welcome back, everyone. Sorry for, you know, hopefully those were really interesting discussions. I know ours got cut off as Wanza was saying something about pay equity. So sorry about that, Wanza. Uh, but we have a few more minutes. So I'd like to do a very quick, I'm going to ask each of the facilitators to share one quick insight on something that was really interesting in terms of the discussion. Maybe Marina, we'll start with you. Absolutely. Uh, hello, everyone. So our uh, discussion focused on strategy. And what we discussed is that it's so important to have intentionality in how the strategy is structured, but sometimes that is not enough. So even if you have a very committed uh, leadership team and board and all the policies in place that doesn't get us to the outcome and what we discussed is something around the power of social norms and specifically self-exclusion that women do themselves and not allowing them to, you know, take on the opportunities that could be even there for them. Great social norms um, shape habits and, and behaviors, right? So um, uh, what about Sophie? That was the other group that talked about strategy. Do we have Sophie? Maybe not. Um, okay, I'll keep moving. So Sarah, do you wanna go? Sure, happy to. So our group talked about attracting, recruiting and onboarding women. Um, similarly, you know, half, I think half of the organizations in the room said they're actually about 50-50 at the entry level and that some of the pain points come in later, but the others did say, you know, it's just a challenge uh, to recruit and attract women. And some of that comes down to culture, organizational culture, um, and some of the real barriers that uh, women may face in trying to balance multiple roles, their care role, and then some of the perceptions around that that we've already discussed. Um, and we talked about the importance of creating structures um, so that these uh, issues are not allowed to really drive the process of recruiting or retaining or promoting talent so that there are real strong performance management um, processes and accountabilities in place. Thanks, Sarah. Sophie, I see you if you want to unmute yourself and speak. Oh, oh here I am. Sorry, uh, yeah. great discussion around um, challenges, especially on promoting women, on hiring them uh, externally when you could promote them internally on having a good balance between men and women. A very interesting question from Shweta about uh, explaining complex policies to women so they don't feel discriminated against when actually the policy is designed to reward them equally. Um, and also um, an, a, a discussion on involving men and how to help men design more gender sensitive plans when they bring the, the design assignments. So a lot of good questions and also uh, good ideas around mentoring, around equal participation of men and women in interviews, pro interview processes. Um, definitely good idea and good energy. Great, thanks. Jenny? Um, yes, so I think we our group picked up on, on some of those conversations as well, although we were, we did have the topic of um, learning and development reward recognition and benefits. 
Um, but yes, the mentoring, I think, was a great example we heard as well. Um, and that has helped move women from sort of middle management to senior management positions. I think another one, so just going back to my slides here, uh, we something else we talked about was just the, the bias issue that even, you know, even for those of us who aren't working within an organization, just our own selves need to think about and improve our own, you know, to fight those biases each day in the way that we, you know, work on projects and work with others. Um, I think that it was encouraging to hear several organizations, you know, several folks mentioned that they have women, you know, female CEOs, women in senior leadership. However, un unlike, I guess, the first example, it was, there were still pain points in terms of getting women into field positions. There's just perception that women don't want to do that. Then there aren't women doing it. And then I, you know, I think because you don't see women doing it, other women don't see themselves reflected in that in that position and you know able to take that on. So those were definitely some you know some of the challenges that you all uh, that the group mentioned. Um, just in terms Thanks, of Jenny. oh, is I'm that it? Cut you off. Okay, yeah. all right. <laughs> yeah, um, you're right. You said two. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Um, we uh, really appreciate it. I know we're right at time, but I I do want to take a couple minutes to wrap this up, and hopefully, uh, you can stay on because now we get to the really interesting part of how to move forward with this discussion. So Sarah, if you want to say a few words. Absolutely. So uh, in addition to the deep dive gender assessment that I shared and that we worked on with the Satara team, we do offer some online instruments that everyone can access. So we have a general online gender assessment survey. I will be sharing the link to that. I believe, Nisha, you have that. So anyone can take that survey. It has two components. One looks internally, one looks externally um, at the women's market. In two days time on the 30th, we will be launching a FinTech specific version of the gender assessment. We've worked with a Findexable and Money 2020 to create that and circulate it. We'll be using the data that we collect from that to create a gender scorecard for the FinTech industry specifically. So that will be available in a couple of days and we'll circulate that link as well. Great. If we can move to the next slide, Anika. So thanks, Sarah. I've shared the link to the, the methodology, which has the links to the survey. Um, what I want to say is to those of you who are really interested in taking this forward, we walked you through the tool and the methodology. Now is your opportunity to actually take the survey. And if you take the survey, uh, then we will invite those of you who have completed the survey to come back and join us on April 20th, where Sarah and I will then work with you to, you know, go over your uh, assessment results and begin to shape that gender action plan that she had mentioned and, and talk about some solutions and actions that you can take. So if you're really committed to beginning this journey of gender diversity and inclusion, Take the assessment and then we'll help you move to the next step and and focus on how we can support, you know, women become a part of financial services, both as customers and as employees and move towards this goal of gender equality. Thank you to my speakers, Sarah um, and Shweta. And then thank you to Marina, Jenny and Sophie for the small group discussion. Uh, thanks to all our participants, and you'll see a quick evaluation at the end of this uh, when you close out, so please fill, fill it out, and we look forward to seeing many of you on a April 20th. Take the survey. Thanks, everyone.